So welcome back. In this video, what we're going to do is build on what we learned in the last video about sensitivity analysis to start talking about how we propagate uncertainties into model runs. So the general idea uh, here of propagating uncertainty is, is really just a can be rethought of as transforming uncertainty in our in inputs into the probability distribution of our outputs. So if we have some distribution of probability distribution of our inputs, we have some nonlinear function. And the question is, what is the probability distribution of our outputs? That's the general case. Now, there's actually a number of ways we can achieve this idea of propagating uncertainty. And we're going to learn about a bunch of them. Uh, and I'm going to broadly classify them uh, based on these two axes. So first, uh, are we going to use an analytical approach? So we have to do math, but we get a, a, a math-based, you know, equation as our solution? Or are we going to use uh, numerical methods where we can use computers to simulate answers? It doesn't give us a general solution, but we can often avoid having to do math. That's one set of trade-offs. And then another set of trade-offs is, do we want a, an approach that gives us a full probability distribution out, or are we going to be OK with a, an approach that just gives us the key statistical moments, usually the mean and variance of our prediction? And you can imagine if, we, if, if all we need is the variance instead of the full probability distribution, it's going to be generally cheaper and easier to get just the moments than the full distribution. But it gives us ultimately less information. So I'm going to tackle these first with what I would call the kind of the gold standard here, which is an analytical solution, which gives us the full distribution. So there's a, a, a formula for this, how to get the analytical uh, transform of one probability distribution through a function to give you its other prob the probability distribution in the output. Uh, and this formula you know, uh, is actually quite complicated. It might not look that complicated, because it's only got a couple parts, but in practice, this is, a, is usually uh, quite a pain uh, to actually apply to most problems with any time models become non-trivial. So first, what you can't do, what you can't do is just take a function and plug the probability distribution into the function. So I can't just take f, f of theta and then put in the probability distribution of theta. What I have to actually do instead is I take the probability distribution of theta and I plug in the inverse of the model into that. Um, oops. Uh, and then I also need to multiply that by the derivative of that inverse. So I take, solve for the inverse of my model, and then I take the derivative of that. Um, where that's gets complicated is that in practice, anytime we have a model that has uh, more than one variable or more than one input, uh, this derivative becomes a matrix of all pairwise derivatives. Uh, so the outputs with respect to every input. Um, so this can be quite a bit of derivatives. And then the, the math of working with probability distributions uh, to solve for a closed form solution that gives a probability distribution out uh, is also usually quite challenging as well. So in practice, this gold standard is, is great to know that it exists, but I will say we don't actually ever end up using this. We're going to rely on other techniques most of the time. So if we're not going to do a, a full analytical solution for the probability distribution, we're going to next move to how do we do an analytical solution just for summary statistics. And so some of the key summary statistics we might be interested in would be like the mean of a distribution, its variance. If we know the variance, we can square root that to get the standard deviation. And sometimes we also are interested in the coefficient of variation, which is just the standard deviation normalized by the mean to kind of express that standard deviation on a percentage basis. So I'm going to take that question of, of how do we uh, make, you know, propagate uncertainties into our predictions and rewrite that into a, a somewhat simpler and more tractable uh, question here of how do we estimate the variance of a model. So if we have some function x that we're using to make predictions with, how do we estimate the variance of that x? And I'm also going to say that we know, we're going to assume we know the variance of the parts. We know the variance of the inputs going into that model. Uh, to explain this, I'm going to use an example. So I'm going to, this technique of, you know, analytically solving for the moments 
I'm going to call it in an analytical moments technique. And we use an example from the, the free air CO2 enrichment or phase experiment at the Duke Forest in North Carolina. So this was an experiment that ran uh, for over a decade. They fumigated a 30 meter radius circle of forest with elevated CO2, 2200 parts per million above uh, ambient and saw how the ecosystem changed. And one of the things, I mean, many, many things that were measured in this experiment was how the soils responded. And so one question would be, are, are the soils storing a higher amount of carbon uh, under elevated CO2, which would be, I mean, is the system, you know, acting as a sink and putting uh, carbon, not just into wood, but also into soils. And this table, uh, which comes from a, a paper uh, by John Drake, who had been a, a postdoc of Adrian Finzi's here at BU, um, tells us what the uh, estimates of all these different pools are in the soil, and then an estimate of their standard deviations. So how do we take all of these pieces of information and add them up? And the question is, can you, can you just add these up and how do you add up the uncertainties? So first, let's think about, can we add up the means? So one thing that's important to think about when it comes to statistical moments is that there are rules that we, for how we combine pieces of information about probability distributions when we want to uh, combine them into an overall estimate. And you, you, I kind of think of these rules as like the algebra for statistical moments. And so the expected value, which is the mean, uh, the expected value of a constant is just that constant. Uh, so C here is going to be constant, X here is going to be a random variable. The expected value of a random variable plus a constant is just the expected value of that random variable plus that constant. The expected value of a constant times a random variable is that constant times the expected value. The expected value of a sum of two random variables is the sum of their means, and that happens even if uh, x and y are not independent. Um, one other really important property here. So all these are additive combinations of constants and uh, random variables. Now things get complicated though if you have non-additive, non-linear operations. So in the more general sense, the expected value of some non-linear function is not going to be what you get if you take that function and you plug in the expected value. And this is known as Jensen's inequality. And it's really, really quite, a quite important statistical concept which means anytime we do a nonlinear transformation, uh, then the, we can't just calculate the mean of something and then plug it into that nonlinear transformation. And that happens a lot anytime you're transforming data, you know, particularly if you're, you know, if you've been taught to, you know, log transform or square root transform or arc tangent transform data, you're going to run into this a lot. If you're working with nonlinear models, you're going to run into this a lot. Um, so basically, it means unless our model is uh, linear and additive, we can't just use these simple analytical properties to estimate the means. Um, other useful property to know is the product of two random variables is the product of their means only if they're independent. So if there's any correlation between those two variables, you can't just multiply the means together. So in this particular case, what we're trying to do is just sum up these terms. And so it turns out that it's perfectly acceptable, even though that these are known with uncertainty, to add up the means to get the overall mean. Now, how do we get the overall variance? So there's a similar set of properties describing variances. <clears throat> and here, it's really important to note that the kind of the algebra of working with variances is very different and, and much less intuitive than means. So means most, except for the fact that you can't do nonlinear functions, means mostly behave as you would expect based on algebra, but variances do not. So if A is a constant and X is a random variable, the variance of a constant times a random variable is that constant squared times the variance of the variable. If we have a variance of uh, a random variable plus a constant, that's just the variable of the variance of the random variable. So constant, additive constants make no difference. And that kind of makes sense. Like if you, if you shift uh, a distribution up or down by some constant amount, you're not actually changing the amount of variability, but as an algebraic property, this is far from an intuitive one. If I add two random variables together, I can add their variances, but then I also need to add their 
two times their covariances. So I need to account for how the two variables are correlated with each other when I add together their variances. And this covariance can make a huge difference. Um, you know, so if, if things are, are, you know, perfectly correlated, uh, you know, the variance is going to be much higher than you would expect by adding the two variances together. If things are negatively correlated such that when one goes up, the other goes down, the overall variance can be much lower uh, than you would expect from just adding the two variances together. And often we don't know uh, a lot about these covariances if we're working with summary statistics. So it's really important to keep track of those covariances. They can really affect these answers. Uh, if we start combining things together, we can have variances of constants and random variables where we have uh, you know, the constant squared, the variances, but then we also have the two constants in front of the covariance. Uh, we could generalize this to sums of random variables. And the last property is asking if, if we know about uh, the some random variable x condition on another random variable y, that the variance of x is the variance of the mean of x given y plus the mean of the variance of x given y. We'll use that last one less in this course. We're going to rely on these other ones a good bit. So if we come back to this elevated CO2 example, uh, our equation says we can add up all of these variances, uh, but we also have to account for these two these covariances. We don't know those covariances, so that's a problem. Um, so here I'm going to make the simplifying assumptions that they're that it's zero, and that's a very tenuous assumption. And if we if we do make that assumption, though, I can add up those variances. So to get from uh, standard deviations to variances, I have to square them, and I sum them all up, and now I get a variance. To get back to a standard deviation in the end, I have to take the square root of this, which ultimately tells us that. Uh, Variances kind of behave like Pythagorean theorem. You have to square everything, sum it up, and then take the square root at the end. Uh, but there's also this covariance term. And so here we get an estimate if we make an assumption about the covariance, but that, that may be tenuous. And to give you an idea why that may be tenuous, uh, you could ask for any particular plot on the ground. Uh, if the fine roots are above average, is it likely that the coarse roots are above average too? Well, yeah, if there's a lot of roots in a plot, there might be, they might be positively correlated. If there's a lot of roots, are there going to be more microbes than average? If there's more roots and microbes than average, is there going to be more carbs than average? It's quite likely uh, that, that in fact, uh, if you sample any particular place on the landscape, that things are going up and down together, which means that the covariances are likely to be positive, which means the actual uh, variance is, is going to be a good higher than what we're getting by just adding the variances together. Uh, but if we do make that simplifying assumption, we get an estimate of the mean, we get an estimate of that variance, we square that back to the standard deviation. And conditional on that assumption, uh, we have you know, a, a separation of about 900 between these two terms. And uh, in the standard deviation on each of these is about 200. So that's gonna, that those confidence intervals are gonna be sufficiently distinct from each other to say that these are separate. Okay, I'm gonna wrap that up. And I'll talk about Taylor series next.